I'm Samara Swanston. The uh, opinions that I express today are my own opinions. I'm not representing any governmental entity. I'm participating in the emissions from the mixing layer art exhibit. This is, of course, a picture of Manhattan, and this uh, red and yellow shows all of the natural gas infrastructure leaks from Manhattan. I'm told this is common throughout uh, industrialized areas. Now, um, one of the problems here is that it is fugitive emissions. It's not being used for heating or cooking or anything like that, and it's going straight up to the troposphere, contributing to climate change. Our earliest memories of energy shortages should go back to the uh, energy shortages of the 1970s and um, the gas lines for people who remember that. And at that time, President Jimmy Carter installed solar panels on the White House West Wing. And he said that either this was going to be an example of the road not taken or the most exciting period in American history. Well, as people know, it turned out to be an example of the road not taken. And he said the panels would end up in a museum, and they did for quite a long time. I understand they've been rescued. And now President Obama has new panels on the White House uh, West Wing. But we uh, now are also concerned about energy for another reason, and that is climate change. So regardless of how much energy they think they're going to find under the Arctic or through unusual methods to get oil or gas, none of the energy that may find if they have uh, 50 or even 100 years or 200 years can address all greenhouse gas problems, which are threatening the security of the entire uh, planet. Um, back in 1990, I worked for the EPA, and the EPA did a risk ranking project, and they ranked environmental threats to American, and they determined, the scientists said, that greenhouse gases were the biggest threats to American that was unaddressed. And they said we needed to reduce our fossil fuel use by 80% of the 1990 levels to stabilize climate. I don't have to tell you, we didn't reduce at all. So now it's too late to stabilize climate. Even though EPA now has the authority to address greenhouse gases, we are in the adaptation mode. But that won't even be successful if we don't transition away from the use of fossil fuels. So this is what my uh, talk is intended to be about, renewable energy. We have the renewable energy now, and we have always had the sources of renewable energy. That can be our answer to a quality future without sharply cutting back our use of energy, which is, has been increasing since the 1970s. So I want to talk about the uh, energy sources that are renewable, the sun, we have the wind, we have um, hydropower, benign and conduit hydropower, and we have geothermal. These technologies are available now to help us address our need for energy. Nothing new has to be invented. And the, the sun uh, has the power to meet Earth's needs by a factor of 1,500, and just 40 minutes of solar radiation could address the Earth's needs for the, for the whole planet, and it could be available for remote locations, places in Africa and, and the like, places that are off the grid, we can use the sun. Now, DOE gave uh, CUNY a million dollar grant to study solar energy capacity in New York City, and CUNY came out with a map that said 650,000 roofs in New York City were suitable for solar energy. We could generate 65% of our electricity needs on our roofs. If we, if we went that way, that would be uh, fantastic. So um, the uh, solar energy is uh, recognized by Plan YC and the Mayor's Office of Long-Term Plan Planning and Sustainability as the key uh, source of energy to meet New York City's 
electricity needs. And this is, you know, our demand for electricity keep going up. We use about 14,000 megawatts of electricity during high peaks during the summer. And this could also ensure reliability so that we don't have to worry about if the grid goes down or if we have a blackout, if we are generating electricity from the sunlight that falls on the roofs of New York City buildings. Um, similarly with wind, wind power has been around since 1854 and in 1888 it was being used to generate electricity in the United States and it generated electricity for a good while I think it was Charles F. Brush had um, created wind um, mill that generated 12 megawatts of electricity that went to his home and uh, there were a couple of other wind uh, turbine um, producers at that time and one of them uh, created 30,000 wind turbines, one of which went to Antarctica with the Bird Expedition, one of them they went to places, remote places in Africa and we have an aero motor which is I think still in existence created 800,000 windmills. It's still around so that we can use the wind to generate electricity. This is, a, we're, we're going to have the wind as long as we have the earth. So that's not going anywhere. And uh, we also have hydropower. Now there's hydropower that can be environmentally damaging, such as when we build dams. And there is also environmentally benign hydropower. So we can use the hydropower inside of our existing infrastructure for, for waste uh, water disposal and for drinking water distribution to generate electricity that can be used for a variety of purposes. And I know that in Keene, New Hampshire and in uh, Denver, Colorado, they're using uh, hydropower in conduit turbines to generate the electricity needed to distribute their water. And I had heard that Keene, New Hampshire was even getting a check back from the electricity company for, because of they had generated so much electricity. So this is something that the city has said they would look at. They would also look at our um, surface water resources, our rivers and, and streams to see to the extent that they could generate electricity. And um, finally, there is geothermal. This has not gotten a lot of attention, but in addition to need, a need to generate electricity, we need to generate heating and cooling. So buildings are the, source, the biggest source of greenhouse gases, everybody knows that. And what they're not saying, it, it is heating and cooling from buildings. And it is the fuel we use for heating and cooling for buildings that is causing the greenhouse gases. So our focus should be on what we can do to reduce greenhouse gases if we want to have a future for our children and our grandchildren and subsequent generations. Um, with geothermal, it uses the shallow lay the heat that is absorbed into the shallow layers of the earth, and that can be using a, a geothermal ground heat ground source heat pump technology. It can be taken from the shallow layers of the earth and brought into our homes. To, um, to the, the, in the lower levels, the temperature is typically like 57 degrees year round in New York, and it only needs to raise the temperature about 20 degrees at max to warm up our houses, and the technology, the compressors can do that. And they also then during the um, summer can take the heat out of our houses and put it back in the ground to balance the heat we took out and provide cooling for our houses. Now, that this, it's such a great um, uh, technology because even though the compressor uses electricity, we would use so much more electricity with air conditioning than the compressor uses taking the heat out of the, our houses and putting it back into the ground and giving us cool air. So we actually can use things as um, simple as uh, soils and water to provide heating and cooling. The Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability and the Department of Energy said this is the most efficient space conditioning technology that is available today 
and the only one that addresses greenhouse gases that would be created at the, at the source. Now, it's true it uses electricity, and the, but that electricity that would then be generated at the power plant where they have scrubbers and they can control pollution. There would be no on-site burning. So for people who have respiratory diseases and asthma, there is no burning inside of the building, which is such an improvement because air quality, which has been significantly impacted by our burning of fossil fuels, is no longer healthy for breathing. So to the extent that we can uh, improve the healthy quality of the air inside our houses, we're better off. So, this technology isn't um, all that expensive when you consider that you, you would be able to give up the purchase of fossil fuels. So, um, the, the City Council has enacted four um, laws that are intended to address climate change and greenhouse gas emissions by reducing or eliminating our fossil fuel use. One is uh, a solar bill that allows you to cover the roofs with more than 30% solar photovoltaic or solar thermal cells without having it count as an additional floor, which without this uh, law, it would be counting as additional floor. So we also amended our zoning code to allow this to take place. The second solar bill allows for solar shades to extend two feet six inches off the building to prevent solar radiation from entering, to reduce the need to cool the uh, buildings and to allow uh, our, our existing cooling to be more efficient. So that's two. The third bill the city council passed in uh, 2012 required the city to study the feasibility of using in conduit hydro to generate electricity through uh, our existing um, water distribution and disposal infrastructure and to look at our uh, rivers and streams and bodies of water. With in-conduit hydro, you can actually install a turbine inside of the infrastructure that is moving water or that is moving wastewater. And water has the ability to turn a turbine because it's very powerful. So with the, it turns the turbine generating electricity. And again, this is another, uh, not a new technology, but it's relatively new and it's already in use in certain places like Dallas. Texas and Denver, Colorado and Keene, New Hampshire and other places are looking at it and so are we. The fourth bill requires the uh, government to do a, a extensive study to look at what would be necessary to retrofit all types of buildings to do geothermal, if we could do campus style or larger geothermal installations and actually requires the city to facilitate geothermal installations. So these are measures that we can use now to walk away from, to transition away from fossil fuel use, and nothing else will address our greenhouse gas emissions. Even if we stop today, we would still have a problem, but if we don't stop in the near future, the scientists can't predict what's going to happen, but they say it's not going to be good. So for example, the Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability has said sea level will rise 55 inches in the worst case scenario. They, I think, are being conservative because the scientists just don't know, but 55 inches is a lot. So anything we can do to uh, make steps now to address long-term impacts or not so long-term impacts would show we provided the right kind of leadership for subsequent generations. So we don't have a whole lot of time, we ought to start now. This natural gas isn't being used. It's just being wasted, straight fugitive emissions. So it's going right up into our atmosphere and contributing to the destruction of our atmosphere by adding massive amounts of greenhouse gases. And as you know, methane is a very 
powerful greenhouse gas. So to the extent that you see red and yellow going up there, that's pure waste. And waste is never acceptable. Waste can never be sustainable. Well, one of the things people have to ask in the future is, who's going to pay for the cost of the, if we're going to repair it, who's going to pay for the cost of the repair of these and other distribution lines? Are we going to pass it off onto our children? Or are companies going to pay for the cost? Or how are we going to address this? Because again, this is waste, this is fugitive emissions. It's not being counted, it's not being used. So who's going to bear the cost of the old leaky squeaky technology? And uh, I don't think it's fair to ask the same people who are ultimately paying for it to also pay for the repair.